Hello, I'm Jonathan Dimmelby. Thanks for taking the time to download this edition of Any Questions from BBC Radio 4. Welcome to Shropshire and to Shrewsbury, which was founded in the 9th century and where we are in the church of St Alcmund, which was founded by a daughter of King Alfred called Ethel Fleda. The church is one of some 2,500 medieval or Georgian buildings that are listed in this Saxon town. On our panel, Anna Subri worked as a presenter on local television and later for ITV, Channel 4 and BBC One, ITV's programme this morning. The first female Conservative to be elected to the National Union of Students, and after a spell recently as a barrister for which she had earlier trained, she entered Parliament in the 2010 election with a majority of 389. She is now Minister of Health for Health. Sally Burko is a newspaper columnist and media commentator. Alongside a starring role in Celebrity Being Brother, she's an active member of the Labour Party, oh, and she lives in the Speaker's House in the Palace of Westminster. Nigel Farage stood against John Burko in 2010, despite the conviction that no one stands against the Speaker of the House. He lost, but he continues to be an MEP and the leader of UKIP. Bob Crow is General Secretary of the Rail and Maritime Union. Describing himself as a communist stroke socialist, he seconded a motion in which last month the TUC voted to consider the practicalities of a general strike. And tomorrow, doubtless, you're going to be on the TUC protest march. Yes. There we are, our panel. Our first question, please. John Davis, was Andrew Mitchell right to resign? We've just heard the news that Andrew Mitchell is resigning and there is to be a new chief whip, Sir George Young. Was he right to go, Anna Subri? Yes. Um, I first met Andrew Mitchell, goodness me, well over 30 years ago when we were students. And I stood in his old seat of Gedling in the 2005 election. And he was always a very good, very kind and supportive friend to me. So I am sorry that he has gone uh, in the sense that, of, of, because of that background and because of my friendship with him. However, uh, I speak frankly, um, he undoubtedly has done the right thing. I wish he'd done it earlier. I think he should have gone earlier. Because I think one of the things that we have to do, all of us that are involved in politics, is to restore the trust between us as your elected representatives um, and you, the people, that have the, the goodness to elect us as your representatives and pay our wages. And if we're quite honest and blunt about this, for a number of years now, that trust has begun to eradicate and politicians are not held in much esteem. I mean... I can talk about these things because I'm an ex-journalist, I'm an ex-lawyer, I hope not to be an an ex-politician, but if you were choosing three careers not to make many friends, those would be the three careers, apart from being a banker. If I leave Parliament, perhaps I should become a banker. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, we need to restore the trust between you and politicians. And And one of the ways that we should do that is that when we do something wrong, we shouldn't mess about, we should put our hands up, as my children would say, we should fess up, Uh, apologise and do the decent thing, which is to resign. And I'm pleased that he has finally done that. What do you make of the selection of Sir George Young um, to replace him as Chief Whip? Sir George has a reputation for being very emollient, quiet, he's beloved on all sides of the House, he wanted to be Speaker. Um, What do you make of his appointment? I'm delighted. He's a a lovely man, but uh, I'm sure... Will let you get away with murder? Oh, certainly not. Uh, I'm sure he will be able to apply the thumbscrews when he needs to, but he'll do it with great charm. Uh, and he will do it very effectively, so I welcome that enormously. Was he right to go? Sally Burko? He was definitely right to do so. I mean, what amazed me is that he managed to hang on for so long. And the issue wasn't that he lost his temper or that he swore, it was that he called people plebs. And that, really, he let the mask slip. You know, he, he I'm did, he did, he did this. He did, in his, in, his, in his resignation note, so we hear... He, he continues to say that he did not He's use always that denied word. calling people plebs, in which case the police are lying. I think it's very unlikely that the police would make up the word pleb. I really do. Um, so the issue is not that he lost his temper, it's that he called them plebs. And I think that just shows the stomach-churning snobbery that is so inherent in the Tory party. Not all Tories, but a lot of them. That is what they think in private. And... He let the mask slip, so who's right to go? Just come back in on that, Anna. Anna. So is, there, is there some... 
Is there some validity in what Sally Burko has just said? No, there's no validity at all. And I think um, the man's done the right thing. I think most people now see it for what it is, which is an unfortunate episode. We draw a line and we move on. If people want to make cheap party political points out of it, I suppose we can't prevent them from doing it. I actually think, as I say, there's a bigger issue. It's about building trust. He's done the right thing. It's let's about move on. Let's talk about Let's talk about the real things. And he has denied using the word. Actually, I find it far more offensive to swear at a police officer, actually. Nigel Farage. I think one of the ways to judge people who've done well in life or have a position of rank in life is to see how they treat taxi drivers, waiters or indeed policemen at the end of the Downing Street Road. And I think what uh, Mitchell did, and whether he said pleb or not, uh, is open to debate. But without doubt, um, he behaved in this sort of completely out of touch, overprivileged, arrogant manner um, that I think the public increasingly find deeply, deeply offensive. So the answer to the question is, yes, it is quite right that he has resigned. He behaved very badly. He'd lost the confidence of Parliament and his own party. Um, although, personally, I'd rather he'd resigned over his period administering a foreign aid budget through which we now give £30 million a day away to regimes like Rwanda with no check on the money. I'd rather he'd resign for that. Ooh. Bob Crow. Yeah, yeah, I, think it's, uh, I think it's right. He did resign. I mean, good riddance to him, to be honest with you. Uh, but it's strange, you know, that... Uh, and by the way, people make mistakes in life. Those people that don't make mistakes are the only people that don't do nothing, uh, to be honest with you. So we all make mistakes, and we should be big enough to put our hands up. Whether he swore or used the word pleb, he still denies it. Uh, the fact of the matter is he was swearing at police officers, and he should have said straight away from day one that he was wrong. This was at a time when only a couple of uh, days before that, we had police officers shot dead in Manchester, going about doing their work, and I think it's scandalous. And I was at a demonstration outside the Tory party conference in Birmingham two weeks ago where there was police up there that were showing to me under their uniforms cardboard cutouts of Mitchell with I'm no pleb. That's the strength of feeling amongst the police officers that took place. But, you know, Anna turns around and says, yeah, he should have fallen on his sword, should have resigned. Well, why didn't you say that two weeks ago, Anna? Why comes all these Tory MPs come to the uh, support of Mitchell and after he goes, they'll say, yeah, he should have gone. We should have said that from day one. You allow this person to disappear, you and he should go. And the fact of the matter is, is, the, is, the, matter is, is the, police, the police are not plebs. They do a job on behalf of looking after it, it, how... It, 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 it is perfectly, that, it is perfectly true, as listeners will recall, that again and again, not least on this programme, when asked about this issue over the last three weeks or so, uh, Conservative politicians and indeed ministers have said, given the same line, um, he apologised to the officer... It's done. He said sorry. The apology has been accepted. Let's draw a line under it. That clearly is not the view that you think should have been taken. No, I mean, I, I think events have moved on and we've got ourselves into a position now where his position... Well, the events have moved on. He's resigned. The, the, the situation hasn't changed. No, 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 no. Events, I think, this week after Prime Minister's questions... Ah. Uh, made his, his whole position untenable. My own view is I, I think he should have fallen on his sword immediately. I think that would have resonated with the public and I think people would have respected him for doing that because it would have been the right thing to do. You can I that. And I will also say this, in sharp contrast to what Nigel said, one of the great things that uh, Andrew Mitchell um, did do in government. He was an outstanding Secretary of State in the International Development Department and I am exceptionally proud of my government's record on helping those countries and those people and those children that need our support and I am proud of the money that we have devoted to those Excuse projects. Excuse me, Anna, but why, Anna, Anna, Anna. No, no. We, we're going to... We're going to... We're going to move on, because we've got a lot to get through, so forgive me. We're going to move on with a oh, reminder we, we, that you can tweet we, us using hashtag... On, yeah. We can... Hush a second. Tweet us using hashtag BBCAQ. The any answers number after the Saturday broadcast of this question is 03700 100 444, and you can email uh, Anita Arnand at any.answers at bbc.co.uk. To our next, please. Andrew Wright. Does the panel agree with John Burko that the security of MPs would be in danger should they be disclosed as landlords to other MPs? The Speaker wrote to the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority in relation to a number of, certainly apparently more than 20 MPs, who are apparently letting flats that they own to others, maybe, we're not quite sure, to other MPs, and then themselves renting a flat and claiming the cost of that 
against their parliamentary allowances, 10, 12, up to £20,000. Um, but the landlords, um, John Burko thinks, should not be named. Bob Crow. Well, I think yourself, they name me for living the council, that's. I don't see the reason why an MP shouldn't be named for where they live. And the fact of the matter is, by the way, I'm not one of these people that believe an MP should live in a tent. I believe that an MP should have good accommodation to do the job on behalf of their constituents. But the fact is, what we can't have is a situation where MPs rent their houses out or rent part of their houses out to other MPs who then claim money off the state to make a profit out of it. That can't be right. And my view is pretty clear, is that an MP should go about their job, whatever they have to do to do their job, they disclose it, all my expenses, for, for example, are online with a certification officer. Everyone can see my, my expenses right across the world. And I don't see the difference between a trade union general secretary that's elected by 65, 70,000 members to a hem MP that does a job on behalf of the people of Britain that they shouldn't be seen to be making money out of money they're receiving from the state. And I think myself we've got to be completely transparent when it comes down to expenses. And certainly for MPs who have got to get some credibility back after the last fiasco that we'd have, the simple way round it is that whatever MPs claim, it should be published and therefore they should get on to do their job. Is the Speaker right, Minister? Yes. Um, and I take great issue with what Bob has said. The expenses of every Member of Parliament are available to every constituent. Many MPs actually publish them on their website. Uh, each and every single invoice that's ever put in, every detail is there. There is full transparency. What some of my colleagues have done, and I'm not going to make any party political points, and some might say one could, I absolutely refuse to. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. What party political point, point oh, well, you Oh, what people make? will say, because the, 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 the uh, MP on the front page of the Daily Mail today is a Lem Labour member of Parliament who apparently has rented out her, her flat to another uh, Well, you can take this Liam Fox, as Chris Brown. And they come from both parties, all exactly, parties. Exactly, but the point is this. Not one of them has acted outside of the rules. They've all acted within the rules. Uh, and I think we're going to have to be very, very honest about this. Are you, happy with, are you happy with these rules as they stand? Yes. They, have, everyone knows they've not broken the rules. No, but I don't rules. think people, maybe forgive me, if no. I could just explain what this is about. This is about members of parliament who have property of their own. And if they live in, and I know this sounds perverse, but these are the rules. If they live in their own homes, in, in these second homes as they are, in London, so that they can carry out their duties of members of parliament, they're not entitled to do what I can do because I rent at your expense, a flat, and I'm entitled to claim my uh, water rates, my uh, electricity and my council tax. But they are not. So the rules are actually skewed against people from living in property that they own. The rules are so perverse that actually I can't live with my 21 and 22-year-old daughter in, in the flat that belongs to my ex-husband because of these rules. And frankly, we have to have an honest debate about this. Because if we don't pay members of parliament, and I accept that the salaries are for most people, a lot of money. 60 plus 60 thousand 60 plus thousand pounds. But the reality of it is we have an expenses system now. I never claim my mileage. There's lots of things I could claim for which I don't claim for. I pay for them out of my own pocket. And we are in real danger that we will have a system of expenses and a scale of pay where it, it means that only people who are absolutely dogmatic conviction politicians or people with substantial private incomes who will go into politics. This is, this, is, this, is, this is perfectly relevant, but it's slightly aside from the point put by Andrew Wright, sure. because IPSA, the authority, yes. is in throes of deciding whether or not... But these, it's, uh, hold it. Sorry. ..whether these landlords should be named. The Speaker says that, it, that their, their security would be at risk and that it He's would cause... Right unwarranted damage and distress. No, but he's, he is right, and forgive me, these are difficult things for members of Parliament yeah. to talk about, but we, many of us have, and I choose my words carefully, we, we have constituents who have made, uh, made threats against us 
um, who are often very difficult. Sometimes they have either a criminal background or they have mental health issues, and one is always sympathetic to that. But there is, we are often in, a, in, in quite dangerous situations, if I may say. But they know who you are. So it's, but, if it's mentioning a name, it's not giving an address. No, but not, not where you live, and perhaps no, where no members one's... of your family might yeah. live. And I think on this one, and I don't always but, but agree just on, just on, just right. on, sorry, And just, if I may yeah, say, yeah, Jonathan, yeah, sure. IPSA made up these rules... And it's for them to determine the rules, and now they're going behind the rules. And I know Sally's itching to get in, and she might be able to make the argument better, perhaps, than I'm making. Are you itching to get in, Sally Burton? I am itching to get in, <laughs> well, actually. Well, fire away. Because the Speaker didn't write to Ipsa because he was trying to cover up no. which MPs are renting to each other. He wrote to Ipsa because it is against the law for MPs' addresses to be published. And if you publish the details of the landlord, it is quite possible to go into Google and to find out where the MPs live. So it's undermining the law. Now, the fact is that, you know, MPs, in my opinion, shouldn't be renting to each other. But it's nothing to do with MPs. Since the expenses scandal, quite rightly, IPSA, the Parliamentary Standards Authority, is in charge of policing MPs' expenses, not MPs themselves. Yeah. So if IPSA don't like the rules that IPSA invented, then IPSA should change them. If you are and looking... it's all very well for the Daily Telegraph to have a pop at MPs, but I'm afraid it's IPSA's rules and IPSA needs to change them if it doesn't like them. Do, do, you, do you think yourself that the rule which allows MPs to both uh, rent out property they own and then uh, rent property themselves and then charge the, the state for, that that's appropriate? No, I don't think it's appropriate. It's an IPSA rule. I don't think it's right. OK, let me come to the second point then, which is about um, your partner, your husband's uh, uh, letter. The, as I understand it, the Daily Telegraph has made it very clear, and others, they don't want to know the addresses. They just want to know the names of the landlords. Now, Absolutely. Uh, 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 well, what, let them what, ask Ips for that. They don't need to publish yeah, the yeah, landlord's details. No, but, but, but we're, you're slightly uncharacteristic if someone is usually so direct. In this case, he said that to give the names, the names would cause uh, damage and distress and be a security issue. Only because to give the names of the landlords would enable journalists to go into Google and to find out where people were living, and that is against the law. MPs' addresses aren't meant to be published. Bob Crow. Is that more than anyone else's uh, addresses being published? I mean, the press uh, regularly come outside my house. I've had the press put in uh, buses outside my house, stop me from going to work. I've been under surveillance for uh, two weeks at a time. Uh, so what's the difference between an MP? It's not the same. It's well, not the well, same. Well, 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 it's not no, the well, same. Well, 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 what's the same? Is I've been stalked. I've been stalked, and that was disclosed by the Leverton Inquiry, that I was stalked by a journalist. Now, that, what's that's the, different. But we what, have members on. of Parliament let, 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 who've let, been assaulted with on. samurai swords in their service. And to be fair, I've been assaulted. An iron bar put round my head in my house where I lived on New Year's Day 11 years ago with nine stitches put in my face. So I've been assaulted. I know what it's like. But the fact of the matter is, if you're in public life, you can't tell me the journalists don't know where you live. They can find where journalists. you live tomorrow morning. What it boils down to, you don't mind other people in society finding out where the journalists live, but you don't find it, you find it too hot when you're in the kitchen yourself. No, it's not about no. journalists. It's about being Nigel safe. Farage. Nigel Farage. The realities of public life, as Bob points out, are pretty harsh. You know, I had someone last year that went to prison for threatening to kill me. So I know about this. Um, I'm afraid the Speaker's argument about the security of MPs and their privacy doesn't work. We live in a Google world. Anybody, frankly, very easily can find out where MPs live. That isn't, th that, that isn't difficult at all. Um, the confusion with this is what we want to know, I think, the public is which MPs are earning income from properties they own from other MPs. The confusion is we don't actually need the landlords of every property that is rented by members of Parliament to be made public. That would be quite wrong. And indeed, there was a letter in today's Daily Telegraph from a Conservative MP saying, my landlady is 99 years old. You know, we've entered into a private contract. If this was made public, her door would get knocked on. So there's been some confusion over this. The real problem is this. We had a system before whereby members of parliament were allowed to basically get a foot on the London property ladder yes. by their mortgages being paid through taxpayers' money. 
And in the case of this one Labour MP, who was on the front pages today, she, for five years, had her mortgage paid through taxpayers' money. She is now in a property that she owns a substantial amount of, earning income, and then taking the money to rent somewhere else. And frankly, that reinforces a perception yeah. that I think the British public have that our members of Parliament are taking the mickey, and it simply isn't good enough. Andrew Wright, you posed the question. Do you, do, do you, Mr Wright, do you agree or do you not agree with John Burko in this, as you put the question? Well, I, I think perhaps it might be yet another effort on the part of MPs uh, not to reveal embarrassing details of their tendency to be a little greedy here and there and from time to time. So I perhaps wouldn't say that it would, it would be too bad if they were known. We'll leave that there with a reminder once more of the Any Answers number, 03 700 100 444, and we will go to our next please. Paul Keeler. Will David Cameron succeed in getting the energy companies to reduce their prices, or is it a load of hot air? <laughs> in the House of Commons, the Prime Minister, to the surprise apparently of the energy secretary in his department, said, I can announce that we will be legislating so that energy companies have to give the lowest tariffs to their customers. It's, um, things have moved on a while from there. No one quite clear where they've moved on to. Nigel Farage. I just wonder sometimes how this government of college kids who've never had jobs in the real world, formulate policy. Are you talking about me? Uh, perhaps it's um, <laughs> late at night over a whiskey or two, and they say, gosh, this would be a good idea. And so out comes the Conservative Prime Minister to say the government are going to fix the price of energy in this country. And then we have the Labour um, opposition from Caroline Flint saying, no, there should be more free competition. That's just how surreal our world has become. I, I, I think there are... Three problems here. Number one is the whole system is bedeviled with complexity because if you get all these different offers through the post or on the phone as to what tariff you can go for, one of the newspapers today said there are over 500 different energy tariffs in the country um, and I think that Ofgen should, as a regulator, make sure this thing is simpler so that we understand how easy it can be to switch companies and switch tariffs. But the real problem is this. And the real hypocrisy is this, and what's being hidden is this. Here you've got Cameron saying it's outrageous that prices are going up, whilst at the same time he, more than anybody else, has supported this loopy idea that we can cover Britain in ugly, disgusting, ghastly windmills and that somehow our future energy needs will come from that. And that already, every one of you in this room is paying a 12% surcharge on your energy bills to subsidise a wind turbine programme that simply won't work. Oh, Fair you're enough. also paying a further 4% for your gas. Um, and, and there are I a number of people wonder, in the audience saying just that's just wonder. not true, but well, unfortunately well, they, they can't, they can't well, well, have well, a chance to respond I, to you in I words. I can assure you, Jonathan, 12% is a conservative figure. It may be slightly higher than no, that. And the other, problem we've got, the other problem we've got with energy, of course, is that next year six of our biggest coal-fired power stations in this country will be closing down due to another loopy series of European Union directives. And I would say that Cameron should not be attempting to fix prices. The regulator should make sure tariffs are free. And we as a country must exploit shale gas and all the opportunities that have given American consumers, that have given American consumers a massive decrease in their energy bills and guaranteed their future energy security. The lights are about to go out in this country okay. because of a total failure okay. Okay. of okay. UK government. Sally Burko. Sally Burko. Cameron's announcement this week, I mean, it was raveling, not within, unraveling, not within days, but within hours. You know, his own ministers had no idea what he was going to be saying and what he says cannot be delivered. And it's typical of the shower who run this show that it's just opportunistic policy making on the hoof. It's back of the bag packet politics, essentially. And what we need is more competition in the market. You know, you've got the big six energy companies completely dominating the market. That needs to be changed. The regulator hasn't got enough teeth. You know, they should be able to force energy companies to pass on price cuts when the wholesale prices fall. They don't. They should be able to do that. The tariffs are far too complicated. And to be honest, the fuel companies are making obscene profits, and they should be capped. And can we hear now from 
Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hold it. They're making up 5% on capital. Hang on, you've had your shout. Nigel, Nigel, pause. You may come back in possibly in a moment, but it is now Anna Subris' turn. Well, I was going to say, we could uh, keep the lights going, couldn't we, with all the hot air that uh, has been generated up here on the platform and, frankly, a whole load of nonsense that is being spoken. I mean, I struggle with anything that Sally says on this issue. After all, this is uh, somebody who supports a a party that was in government she may have forgotten for 13 years. So uh, anything that she talks about, I think we really have to see it with a very cynical eye because there were 13 years to sort out those problems and they didn't. So let's look at where we are. And I think the Prime Minister has recognised Recognise that for many people um, that there is a situation where there are all sorts of tariffs. Many of us lead very busy lives. Frankly, we haven't got the time to go onto the internet and find this tariff and that tariff and go on this website or go on that website and try and work out where you can get the better deal. And he's absolutely spot on when he says that in our energy bill, what we will do and what we will ensure is that the duty is placed on the various energy companies to make sure that they offer us and make sure that we are on the right tariffs. And I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and, and that's why his, what he has said, and today Ofgen has come out uh, with a report where it's exactly looked and identified at all, all these problems and it's been welcomed. His, his idea Ideas have been welcomed not only by Ofgen but also by which. Why is that? Because he's on the side of hard-working families and he's determined uh, to try and help uh, them make sure they can pay their bills. Was it all as clear as day or clear as mud? after he had made this statement in the House and, and the, the Department of Energy was rushing around, headless chicken-like, uh, to try well, and come your, up with a statement. That's your view. Well, it's, 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 it's the observation, it's it's the observation the I put Haynes to you. It's, yesterday it's, in Parliament, who made it very clear what the situation is. I mean, one of the things that I've learned in the admittedly only six weeks People were very entertained, I gather, in Parliament by John Hayes' performance. I wasn't there, I was busy working in the Department of Health. But one of the things that I've learned as a minister is that there, is, there's a, there are great conversations that happen, often between departments. Uh, and those conversations, as you might imagine, will involve the Prime Minister. Uh, and ideas often get floated about, and they are going to happen, and it just so happens that the PM found an opportunity to say this, and he said it because he was talking about how we could help to make sure that people can pay their bills. So, so they get do you the do you speaking So there the was cough. no great shock over in the environment, in, in the energy uh, uh, Just one thing then. So are you, are you saying that you are convinced that the energy companies will have to give the lowest tariff to their customers. Oh, I, I believe that when the amendment is made to the energy bill we will get the sort of system that many people want whereby we will put the duty on the energy companies to make sure that they, that they are providing us with the right information so that we are on the right tariffs and get us on the right tariffs and not rely too much on us having the time to go on this website or that website. I mean the whole thing is a mess and where I think we do agree is that and, and again this is something that we're very keen to put forward is that we see more independent operators coming into it so that there's better competition which will I believe solve many of these problems. Bob Crow. Well I'm a one person minority here tonight I'm against what Anna said because it was the Tories that privatised the gas and electricity companies let's remember those people made a fortune out of it I'm opposed to Sally when she turns around and says more competition. What we really want is the person that lives at home is more concerned about what their energy is going to get. Don't forget, in the second round of pit closures, not the first round of pit closures of 84, 85, but the pit closures that took place in the early 90s, it was the dash for gas. We were told that gas was going to be so cheap that we had to sh- shut coal mines down in Great Britain. Here's an island with 300 years of coal beneath us, and we've only got left 1,700 miners producing some of the best coal in the world. And the reality is this. When people say about competition, there's only one way that we can compete, and that's by taking back into full public ownership all of the gas and all of the electricity of Great Britain. Every single part of it. And I'll tell you another issue as well. When people talk about Nigel, well, I'm going to fall out with him, on windmills, as he says, but I call wind farms. Windmills, wind farms is an opportunity to have the most friendliest environmental way of energy. The rea- 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 reality is, it's pretty simple. No, the reality is that if you use solar and you use hot rock and you use tidal, you can use wind as well to provide a hell of a lot of our energy. The fact of the matter is, why is it that we're all walking around in October 
with no coats on and sweating with leaves on the trees because you've got an environmental problem. Unless you sort this environmental problem out very quickly, the next generation of children are going to be living yes, in a right. world that's right. totally coated in carbon right. dioxide. I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring in Sally Burke. Right. Sally, right. Sally, why you were shaking your head vehemently when Bob Crow was talking about wholesale renationalisation? Why do you think that is wrong? Well, I think we should introduce more competitivity into the market. What would happen if you had renationalisation? Labour want competition, what, but Tories what, want fixed what would, prices. What would, you, marvelous, what would happen? No, we what would happen? Do you think if you renationalised, as, as Bob Crow would like? I don't think prices would be lower if you renationalised. I absolutely don't. I think competition is the way to get prices lower. Um, and Bob's right, we should be investing more in green energy like tidal and wind. Don't get me wrong, we absolutely should. But in the short term, you know, we do rely on standard energy. And to, to make it work, we absolutely have to have more competition within the market. Bob, wind energy does not work, and it doesn't work. The Germans have built 19,000 wind turbines. They're now building nearly 20 new coal-fired power stations to back up the wind turbines, yes. because in the winter... In the winter, when you have peak electricity demand, and Nigel, the wind turbines produce Nigel, nothing, Nigel. and they don't even... I know you're worried about global warming. They don't even, as a net effect, reduce CO2 Nigel. emissions. And what Nigel. happens is, Nigel. people Jonathan, like Jonathan. you, hang on, hold on. People like hang on, you Jonathan. in this Jonathan. audience, I'll respect, pay... Nigel, hold, on, let me hold a second, I'll let, let you... Hold, uh, now, Bob, look, hang Bob, on, you, you two gentlemen at the end... Just, I'll let you in, Bob, in a second. Finish your point swiftly once you've addressed the audience. socialist, Bob, how can it be right that these people pay a 12% surcharge on their electricity bills so that people like David Cameron's father-in-law earn a £1,000 a day for just citing wind turbines on their land. Well, Nigel, be very, that to a Nigel, I'll be very brief. The reason, why there's a, the reason why there's a tax on energy at the moment is research to go into more forms of greener energy like solar. I'm not really bothered about David Cameron's father-in-law. I'm bothered about my grandchildren in the future. Absolutely and the reason why the Germans are investing in other forms of environmental friendly energy Cold. is because they're going to do away with all nuclear energy, lock, no, stock no, and barrel. No, no, right, no, you both, you both had your, you both had your say. Uh, uh, you wanted to add something, Anna Subri. No, I was quite happy to sit here and hear such great nonsense has been spoken certainly on this side by Nigel and I just don't think no. he's advancing the argument and I certainly don't well. want to see more coal-fired power stations. Thank you very much. We will go to our next... Veronica Davis, should Prince Charles be able to correspond with politicians on a confidential basis? The Attorney General, um, citing the Freedom of Information Act, which exempts the sovereign and the first two in the line of succession, um, refused to allow the request for some letters written between Prince Charles and ministers um, to be released. Um, Sally Burko. I think Prince Charles's letters it should be published. The High Court said they should be. The Attorney General overruled it. I don't think it's the job of the Attorney General to protect the future King. If the future King wants to lobby Parliament, we need to know what he's lobbying Parliament about. It was, it was, the, it was the, the last government of which you were, I, I presume, a, a relatively enthusiastic supporter that actually introduced this exemption to protect specifically in constitutional terms, the Queen, the two heirs, um, the next right. two in succession, from their correspondence being released publicly if That's it was right. confidential. Well, I'm in favour of transparency. I think that the monarchy should be transparent, and if Prince Charles or the Queen or anybody is lo uh, uh, lobbying government, we have every right to know about it. They're meant to be politically neutral. Um, Bob Crow. Well, I mean, I don't know what the, the uh, confidentiality means. I mean... Surely people, at the end of the day, are entitled to some confidentiality. Some people will say, well, you know, if you, uh, what have you got to worry about? Well, that's the case, then. Let's put a, you know, a camera in everyone's house and at night time film what they do because you've got nothing to worry about, so why should you worry about it? At the end of the day, people are entitled to have confidential uh, discussions. Now, if it's about on the basis that they're acting on behalf of a certain group, then, of course, in any kind of uh, way that someone's been trying to obtain contracts or whatever, that's got to be transparent. But if the Prince Charles or anyone else, by the way, I'm not jumping up to protect Prince Charles, but anyone in society wants to write a confidential letter to me, 
It may be streetwise stuff. Confidential to me means confidential to someone tells me I can tell someone else about it. Spot on. Rather astonishingly, astonishingly, given the conversation that there has been on the panel so far, you just you may not have heard, been heard. Anna Subri said, "Spot on." Spot on, absolutely. Bob Crow, absolutely right, and I have no trouble in agreeing with him on this whatsoever, because these letters were not about lobbying government. The heir to the throne had written to various government departments in confidence, and he wrote those letters believing that they were confidential as part of the process that he would go, he has gone through, so that. Um, when the time comes, he can uh, rule as an effective king. Uh, I have no difficulty whatsoever uh, with the Attorney General's decision. It's used extremely rarely. I, I think it's only been used five times since 2006, and I think that the AG has done absolutely the right thing. He wrote those letters in confidence as the heir to the throne, and I think we should respect that confidence. Nigel Farage? I don't think anything... I don't think anything in public life, if you're writing to a government ministry um, and to a minister that you may have met once or twice, um, frankly, could be regarded as being confidential. It's, it's rather naive to think in the end that it will be confidential. Things get leaked. If you put it in writing, it gets leaked. And, we, you know, we can all pick and choose. I mean, I quite like his views on architecture. I'm appalled by his views on global warming. Um, I'm appalled by the idea he wants the EU to have more power to deal with these things. But we shouldn't pick and choose. I just think this guy is in line to be our next monarch, our next constitutional monarch. The Queen, good health that she's in, is 86 or 7 years old. And I feel that Charles oversteps the mark and frankly behaves like a political lobbyist and I don't like it. And if, when he becomes the king, he behaves in this way, he could precipitate a constitutional crisis, I would say keep out of political lobbying and do us all a favour. Absolutely. Let me ask just the, 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 the audience here. Do you think Prince Charles should be able to correspond with politicians on a confidential basis, Veronica Davis asked? Who thinks he should be able to correspond on a confidential basis with ministers? Would you put your hands up? Those who think he should not be able to, or the letters should be made public, would you put, put your hands up? Well, here there is a significant majority in favour of the decision made by the Attorney General that... Um, I'm Letters happy to take your view on that, but uh, actually I think it was more 50-50. Yeah. Well, we'll we're doing and I think okay. a lot of, hold on, I think hold a lot on, of doing, people let, abstained. Let's, let's do it once more then, to be absolutely clear. <laughs> Who I, thinks that, it was, uh, that it's, it's right that, he should be on a, uh, that those letters, he should be able to write confidentially? Would you put your hands up? Right. Oh. Who thinks that, it's not, that he should not have that right, that the letters should be published? Well, I think that the majority is not... Who doesn't not, who, who has no view about it? <laughs> Not very many. Right. Um, anyway, no, well, we I'm, I'm going to summarise. Okay. I think there is a majority in favour of, of, of the privacy. Yeah. There's a majority in favour of privacy, okay. but there's a significant number who think that they Excellent. ought to be published. Well, that's very that, good that, that summarises the agreement. No, no, all absolutely. Panel. I'm sure Bob and I are delighted. OK. <laughs> we'll go on to our next, please. A new coalition's just been formed. <laughs> Sally Sutton, does the EU deserve the Nobel Peace Prize? The, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded for the EU for its alleged contribution to peace. Um, I think we might start with Sally Burko. Oh, goodness. Now, it's not fashionable to stick up for the EU, I know that, but it is true that they have, you know, being part of the European Union has brought us peace and stability and kept us out of wars. I mean, it absolutely is true, and I know it's not fashionable to say that, and I would be one who would very much argue that we should let the people have a say and have an in or out referendum on Europe. And I think the public would come round and they'd see people like Nigel Farage mounting his isolationist bandwagon and think, uh-uh, I don't want any of that. I want to stay in the EU. But, you know, the EU has done a lot for us and it would be a mistake for Britain to leave. Bob Crow. The Peace Prize. Well, number one, we're talking about the question was, well, should they get the Nobel Peace Prize? And no, they shouldn't. Uh, because when people say that they brought the Europe together, well, Yugoslavia, there was a war. Quite. They helped to uh, support the illegal wars in both Afghanistan and Iraq. And they've carried on supporting Israel against the Palestinian people having their own state. Move that way from one way, I'm absolutely clear down the line. There should be a referendum of the people of Britain to decide whether they want to be part of the European Union or not, 
If it's good enough for the Scottish people to decide whether they want independence, then it should be good enough for the British people to decide whether they be part of the European Union, and I'll be arguing to get out of Europe and into the world. We, we, we may pick up this a little bit more in a moment. Um, Nigel Farage. Well, it's quite true that Germany hasn't invaded France since 1945. <laughs> Uh, but equally, we haven't had the plague or a major meteorite hit. Um, you know, I don't think Germany would have invaded France after 1945. She was spent, she'd been destroyed, and I don't think that Herman van Rompuy and 30,000 overpaid bureaucrats um, are really the reason that we've not had that kind of war in Europe. But, but my concern about it is this. Oh, and by the way, don't forget, we've all won. All of us. Everyone must have prizes. We're all winners of the Nobel Peace Prize. My concern is this. You know, we all grew up with, Nor with Europe being split from east to west by the Berlin Wall, and we're now living in a Europe that is split from north to south by the catastrophic error that is economic and monetary union, the Eurozone. We now have the Greeks, you know, dressing up in Nazi regalia when Angela Merkel visits them. We have the press in northern Europe, in Finland, in the Netherlands, in Germany, being really abusive about the Portuguese, the Spanish and the Greeks. I mean, Europe is now really very split and turning against each other. And actually, the danger is this, that whilst I've always accepted that the EU was set up on a very high ideal of trying to stop war and make the world a better place, just as communism wanted to make the world a more equal and fairer place, the reality is the approach they're taking now in stripping national democracy away, particularly from the Eurozone countries, will actually lead to an increase in extremism and nationalism and violence, and they're just about the last people I would have given the Nobel Peace Prize to. And I, sadly, I think it will devalue the Nobel Peace Prize for years and years to come. Do you believe... <laughs> do, do you really believe, as, you, as I think you've said, that Herman van Rompuy, who you mentioned just then, the president of the... European Union and his colleagues are, I quote you accurately, I hope, very, very dangerous, bad people. Extremely dangerous, bad people. I realised that, Jonathan, in 2005, when in free and fair referendums that took place in France and the Netherlands on a European constitution, the people rejected the constitution and they decided they would just rebrand it as the Lisbon Treaty, force those powers through, and if you now look at what they're saying, they are now openly... I mean, Mr Barroso used the F word in the European Parliament last month. I mean, to hear federal being said openly, I was very, very shocked. And, and they've made it clear, he said himself, that democracy can no longer remain with the nation-state. It must be transferred to a European level. That means to people like him, that is a very dangerous and bad route for Europe to go down as a continent. Anna Subri. Well, I'm going to answer the question. Uh, I don't believe... I don't believe the EU should have been awarded the Peace Prize because I, I believe it has been devalued as a result because I think it's the sort of award that should be given to individuals uh, as opposed to states or groups of states. <laughs> However, having said that, I, I would pay tribute to all those nations of the European Union and beyond who have ensured that there has been so much peace within Europe. And Bob makes powerful points uh, about the breakdown of Yugoslavia uh, and, and what we saw then with, with dreadful wars. But by and large, we should, you know, I think it's very easy in 2012 to forget what it must have been like for our grandparents and our great-grandparents' generation, and, and, and to go through the appalling horrors of the First World War, and then almost, well, it was, it was within not really not very many years at all, to go into the horrors of the Second World War. And, and I'm proud to be in a union at, on, at, uh, on this level where people are wanting to be more friends as opposed to being foes. And, and I think, forgive me, Nigel, but at times I think you get, I know you get terribly excited, but I think you forget how proud we should be that we come together as much as we do to work in cooperation and we don't fight in the way that we used to Can fight. I ask you this, do you... The, as, as everyone else has referred to a referendum, are you convinced that the Prime Minister will go into this next election committing the Conservative Party to a referendum, an in-out referendum? Oh, I hope so. I'll tell you why. 
because I think some of us actually find this debate now getting, if I may say, somewhat tedious. <laughs> and I think we need to lance the boil. But I, what I think we need to do, first of all, I mean, I absolutely take the view that the European Union is over-bureaucratic, it costs us too much money, it takes away too many of our powers, it's tangled up with red tape, it does loads and loads of things absolutely wrongly, and we need to be within it to reform it, and if we reform it, that's when we go back and do to the you people imagine... and we say to you then, in or out, and I tell you, do you can, if we, can I just, sorry, but quickly, I just think it needs saying, because I happen to believe that the British people are actually very sensible people, and I believe that if we make those changes and we come back to the people and we have a proper debate without some of the, the heat and some of the lunacy that is often generated... What about the truth? How well, about that? And not that interrupting, bad, and not interrupting no, 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 people. No, no, you're much too and having, to I'm not at all... In, I'm just trying to be well-behaved and show yes, some yes, manners, yes, if I may say. Um, and I will finish my sentence. If we have that sensible debate, I believe the British people will see the value of staying in the European Union. If, if there is a referendum, Nigel Farage, the Conservatives will have shot your fox, won't yeah. they? Well, if there is a referendum, it will be because they are so fearful of losing votes to UKIP in huge numbers, and we will have caused that referendum to happen, and I'll be very immensely pleased and That's proud if the people rubbish. of this country actually get a chance, an opportunity, to express an opinion on who governs this country, and I will abide and accept the result. What I won't accept is being told lie after lie by Tory and Labour governments about the common market and there's no need to worry your little heads when they now make 75% of our laws. Let's have a referendum. Let the people decide. We will leave that there, I'm afraid, because that's all we have time for. Next, next week we're going to be in South East London and amongst others on our panel, the former Home Secretary Charles Clark. hope you can join us there. To hear, hear, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you for having us in St. Altman's Church in Shrewsbury. Don't forget any answers. Quick chance the number 03 700 100 444. Goodbye. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed any questions this week. To find out more about the programme or how you can get us to come to your area, then go to the BBC Radio 4 website and search for 